Yep, this weekend we're celebrating Trinity Sunday on a Saturday. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nope, not three gods. We have one. Now, a lot of times in the history of the Lutheran Church, we have rolled out the Athanasian Creed. It's two big pages long of almost a computer program type thing where it says, you know, this of the Father, and then this of the Son, and this of the Holy Spirit, but not this of the Father, not this of the Son, not this of the Holy Spirit. It's a long thing. And even if we were to go through it, I would just be curious if there wouldn't be someone in the back of the church that would just yell out, prove it! Wouldn't that be something? If you just, if you felt it within you, just stood up, prove it! Of course, I'd be taken back a little bit, so I'm really glad you're not doing that, but <laughs> let's just say it happened. And I'd be a little bit flustered, and I'd, I'd have to say, well, excuse me, well, what do you mean prove it? I, I don't prove it, I, I believe it. And... And the person would just wouldn't let it go and just say, well, well why? Well, what do you mean, why? I'm a Christian. Christians believe in the Trinity. Oh, well, that would really set the person off too. Well, that's just circular logic. You're, you're, Christians believe in the Trinity. You're a Christian, so you believe. That makes no sense. I was like, oh. And then the person just, you know, had the floor at this point, and we're all kind of giving our attention. So, you know, it, it doesn't even say in the Bible, Trinity. You know, nowhere does, does God refer to himself as a trinity. Nobody says or calls God a trinity, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In fact, the big confession of the entire Bible that are on the very lips of Jesus is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, you just heard Isaiah. He got to see God, right, in the temple. He got to see that big flowing train, and the, the seraphim were flapping their wings, and they were calling out, holy, holy, holy. Isaiah saw the king, the Lord God Almighty. He didn't see three, did he? I'm really glad that person's not here today. But it does kind of leave us with something to think about. It's like, you know, we, we probably really do need to come up with some, some answers to this if, if we're really going to know God. And it's more than just knowing about Him, but to know Him and to love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You better have something better than, well, I just believe it. Or it's always been the, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity because if it's just a personal belief, what well, people personally believe all kinds of crazy stuff, from flying saucers to alien invasions. If it's just what you believe, why, why would it be any more authoritative, any more sure and true than someone who truly believes in their own heart something very different from, say, uh, the Indian god, the Hindu god Vishnu? Or maybe uh, they believe in Allah. Or maybe they believe in Kabbalah. Maybe they've thrown the whole thing out and they just believe in atheism. Think about that. Or maybe they believe, you know, in scientism. Why could you refute it? How could you prove it? How, if it's just your personal belief? Well... If you're ready to take on this little challenge, I'm ready to go with you. You know, because we have something so much more than, well, it's what I believe. We've even got something better than the Bible tells me so. We've got history on our side big time. Oh yeah, not just the 2,000 year history of the Christian church and its consistent confession of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's not convincing history. The history I'm talking about is that nothing in the present reality just popped into existence. Something in the past history had to have happened and now here it is. For example, the examples make the point here. Like, you're, you're in a Lutheran church, right? You're not hallucinating. You're not dreaming. Nobody made it up. You're really in a Lutheran church. Why? Because in history, 
There was a man by the name of Martin Luther who got kicked out of his church. And lots of people went with him. And now, because of this historical man, 500 years ago, now here we are sitting in a Lutheran church. Now, history has nothing to say about his doctrine, whether it was right or wrong, or whether he should have or shouldn't have. No. The only thing about history is something happened. And now here it is. Well, you could take all kinds of things, like the reason that there are Mormons in the world today is that back in the 1800s, there was a man by the name of Joseph Smith who claimed to have, have had a vision of the angel Moroni, which gave him these special spectacles in which when he put them on, he could read these golden tablets written in an angelic heavenly language. And there he translated it into uh, King James English, which is the Book of Mormon. History makes no evaluation on what that was other than it was. There was this man, and now there is. Why, you could even say that about uh, the Muslims, that there really was a man 500 years after the birth of Jesus. Historically, was, his name is Muhammad. He claimed, too, to have a vision of an angel. This one was Gabriel. Gave him all the words of the Quran. He, and uh, now there are Muslims in the world. Doesn't have to be a religion either. Could just be an idea. Nothing just pops into existence. But there was a man in history by the name of Charles Darwin. And now, today, we, many people believe in evolution because he went down to the Galapagos Islands. He observed the birds and the lizards and the fish and the tortoise. He wrote out the origins of the species. History makes no evaluation of whether it's right or wrong. Just that it was. Something happened. Why, you could even go back as far back as you want. And the reason that there are Buddhists is because 500 years before the birth of Jesus, there was a man, I can't pronounce all of his name, but it's gotten a something, and he was sat under a lotus tree. He was so fed up with all the polytheism of his day and the Hinduism, and then he was enlightened. We don't need any of these gods. We have enlightenment and wisdom within ourselves and now there are Buddhists in the world without any evaluation of what they taught or what they said whether it was right or was wrong history is the great witness something happened well that's exactly how Peter began his case before the Jews in Jerusalem. He began with undeniable history that had just happened that very day. The people he was speaking to had all experienced it together. That there in the city of Jerusalem, a violent wind tore through the city and men and women who had previously been with Jesus then proceeded to walk out into the city speaking in languages they had never previously learned. Speaking to the, the Parthians and the Medes, the residents of Mesopotamia and Pamphylia, the residents of, of Rome and Arabia, and all of them heard the wonders of God being spoken in their own language. Now some people said, well, it's, it's a trick or it's a joke or they're drunk. But nobody said, we're all hallucinating. This isn't happening. It's a historical event. The Holy Spirit came they spoke in these other languages. Now Peter, he stands and he gathers the people to explain what does this mean by appealing to history. That Jesus Christ, this man you crucified, the reason this Holy Spirit has come, the reason that they can speak in which you can hear in your own language, is because this Jesus whom you crucified is no longer dead. His tomb is empty. Now, this would have happened 53 days before Peter was before the people. And as he appeals to the empty tomb of Jesus, if it were not an historical fact, they could have just shook, shook their heads and said, Peter, you're, you're dreaming. And they could have just taken him right over to the tomb of Jesus. They were in Jerusalem. And they, they could have shown, well, here's his tomb. It's all sealed up. See the seal that Pilate had put around it's not been opened. There's been a guard here these past 50-some days. But they didn't dispute it because the seal had been broken. 
The tomb was open. They could have gone in and everybody verified this tomb is empty. It's a historical fact. Now some people said, well, his body was stolen, you know, and, and that's how all this happened. But there were eyewitnesses who had seen the risen Jesus. And they said, God has raised this Jesus to life. We are all witnesses of it. He's now exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from his Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out on what you see and hear today. Pointing to what has just happened in their own eyes before them. And then saying that this Jesus now is living. We have seen him. It's a fact and now what you have received in this great Holy Spirit was sent by Him. And then he, he appeals to even more of the historical facts that have just happened in the day. He says, uh, this Jesus of Nazareth was accredited to you. You have seen Him do the miracles, the wonders, and the signs. It would have been very likely that Lazarus, that Jesus raised from the dead in Jerusalem or outside there, was right there with Peter. This man was dead for four days. Historically, he's alive, right? You're not hallucinating. He's alive. It would not have been a big stretch to have people in that crowd who had eaten the bread and the fish sandwiches of Jesus. It would have been very reasonable for the man who's, who was blind and Jesus healed him at the temple right before he died. Say, yes, yes, I can see because of this man. All of these historical events, the miracles... His death, His empty tomb, His resurrection, the sending of the Spirit. 3,000 people came to faith that day. And now, this many years later, a billion people say that this Jesus, who did all these miracles, has risen from the dead and will come again. Now, history by itself cannot give you that kind of faith. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. But the fact that there are a billion people is a pretty good historical witness to the work of the Spirit. So as we then listen to Jesus, what did He say about Himself? He said that I and the Father, we are one. He said the Father and I, I've seen the Father. I've come from heaven in John chapter 1, Jesus said, The Father created everything through me. Nothing has been made that I did not make as the Father's bidding. And then Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. John says, We have seen His glory. We have beheld Him. We have witnessed the miracles as eyewitnesses. And then sending of the Spirit. The reason that the Christian church has proclaimed the Trinity isn't that we think there are three gods, but the one God has showed Himself to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we use the Latin term triune, three, one, as just a way to say, this is who He shows Himself to be. And we have the historical record to back us up. We have something to say to the scientist who believes in evolution, saying, you know what, we have history on our side. You can only examine the examinable world, but you can't go beyond that. You're making claims beyond that. The one who is beyond it, we have seen and beheld. And he says he has created this. We have an answer to those who would believe in other religions. They say, well, you've changed the historical record. God himself has showed himself. He has walked among us. He has died for our sins. He has risen from the dead. The tomb is empty. History is on your side. History will not give you a faith and a love for God. But as you do examine your heart and you realize you do believe and you do love Him, it is a testimony, historical record in your body of the living Jesus and the Spirit that is in you. And so we worship. And for those of you that may not have that faith, Jesus is here. To give it. It is a gift. It is available. It is yours. And so we worship the Trinity. I invite you to please stand.